bring it where everyone is, right? All torn up and probably still in bed. But you know, I'm going to, like I was, I was talking to Chris up here, I'm alleviating anxiety because in a few days, you guys will receive an email and it will link to the uh, presentations, the slide decks from our speakers. So if you've missed one, um, we are filming some of the presentations yesterday. We got it going today. Excellent. Thank you, thank you. And these will be on the DFIR website. Awesome, awesome. So hopefully that if you miss one or had to choose track one and wanted to see track two also, this is this is a problem we're taking care of for you. Ooh, I have to mention evals because we have another set of evals today. Uh, one is going to be for the entire event and one is for today's presentations. Ah, but there is a reward. A massive reward because we received some evals for yesterday's presentations. You will be, hold on one second. I have to show it. It's this shirt. Ooh. It's going to be, I know. What? <laughs> so the following individuals are going to be receiving that awesome sand shirt because they turned in their evals for, for yesterday's presentations. Yeah, Chad's like, oh, I hope it was me. Did I do that? Because I don't freaking remember anything from yesterday. <laughs> All right, it's Kevin Smith. Kevin Woo! Smith. Ow, ow, ow. You, you got to go to the uh, the registration office. Don't get uh, you're, he's like running up here as if uh, yeah yeah no no. I'm just giving you the that's the demo shirt. I can't give it that way. Where's the shirt gun? Where's the shirt gun? So the following individuals will go to the registration desk for the shirt. Yeah. Not run up here. And, all right, Jonathan Milford, awesome job. Dude, and these people actually here this morning, as opposed to the slackers that didn't turn in their eval or show up this morning. Uh, Michael Campbell, damn, I'm starting to see a pattern. Okay, Casey Easton, Casey, wow, he's here as well. Casey, awesome job. Edward Hunter, oh, and Darren Windham. All right, someone converted him last night. All right. Uh, uh, what's that? Five, Five or six. Oh, there's like three more. Steve Cypher. Nice. Good job. Alex Bond. Yeah, we know him. Someone will come before him. Pretend that him. Anthony Layton and Ryan Benson. There you go. Ryan. So you guys, as soon as this is over, head to the registration desk and pick up your shirt. There are two lunch and learn sessions today. Um, let's see, Vitellis, Cybersecurity Solutions, and Click Security. Have you signed up for these yet? What? Well, right. Sign up for the registration desk. At the break. Uh, at the break, not now. Don't run and do it now. No. Okay. Um, anything else, anything else? Ooh, we have next year's summit dates, July 7th to the 8th, and the training will be afterwards next year. So people will be all torn up going through six days of training. I'm sure we can recover from that. <sighs> All right, I would like, I have the honor of introducing today's keynote speaker um, from Mandiant. I, I am from Mandiant too, and uh, I have some interactions with uh, Mr. Chris Glyer. Not Dr. Chris Glyer, I got that right. Though. Mr. Chris Glyer actually hooked me up. I was set to investigate an intrusion and was given a machine, and uh, I was taking my time, man. He's like, where's the malware? And I was taking my time. Where's the malware? I was looking, I was looking. It goes silent on the wire. I don't hear from Chris. I don't hear from Chris for about 90 seconds. I hear from Chris, I found an hour. Continue on, young Padawan. Ah! This guy, he's a technical director at Mandiant, but he's, a, he's responsible for keeping the institutional knowledge, passing it on to people that work with him. And it is an honor to have him today to talk about everything that they've seen uh, over the last year at Mandiant. So thank you very much, Chris, for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, my role at Mandian um, is I do you know, lead investigative teams. Uh, so, typically teams of anywhere from two to maybe six uh, when we conduct uh, IRs. And, you know, be the primary kind of interface with the client, serve as kind of set the overall direction for what we're doing, what we're looking for, what we're prioritizing, uh, helping the client come up with their remediation strategy. And, actually doing forensic analysis myself as well. So kind of mixing all those in and uh, you know, lining up all the different analysts between network analysis, host-based analysis, malware analysis, uh, and keeping everything going. And then, as she mentioned, kind of uh, helping teach and train other people within, within Mandian um, and uh, kind of set direction and, and do research on some of the newer things we're seeing. So uh, this particular presentation is uh, from one of our 
from one of our uh, our case our uh, clients that we have in, in our managed pet portfolio. So uh, we did an investigation there several years ago. We do ongoing monitoring for them, and then as part of that, we then find uh, breaches and then do kind of quick search investigations in the last couple of days, push the attackers back out. So this uh, this set of case studies, there's four of them. Uh, over a six month period, the client was uh, attacked four different times by three different attack groups, um, and each attack was kind of unique or interesting. Um, so I want to kind of talk about each one, what made it interesting, what made it unique, uh, and, and I guess we'll get started. So in general, detection is really hard. Detecting an advanced attacker who wants to get into your network is exceedingly difficult. And there are a lot of companies that are trying to come up with new technologies to do it, uh, but th there's no like silver bullet. There's no, um, there's nothing right now that's foolproof. Uh, and so the, the, the point of this talk is, in addition to focusing on detection, you need to think about different areas of the attack lifecycle that you can then target your monitoring to then maybe find evidence of the attack. So you may not find it day one or, or day two, but you may find it day 10 and work your way back. And if you work, you work your way back quickly, um, you, can, you can push the attack out before they get a real strong foothold in the network. So in general right now, the industry is pretty much failing in detection. Um, in our caseload, uh, it takes on average 229 days for our clients uh, in, in last year to, to identify uh, a breach. Now, that, that number is probably skewed a bit in terms of the organizations that we work with uh, are going to tend to be ones that are going to be less mature. Uh, there are ones that they don't know that they have issues that may have gone on to control for, you know, potentially several years. Uh, and they're either being notified by an external source like the FBI or uh, the car brands if it's a common point of purchase or, or, or some other thing. <coughs> Uh, in this particular set of case studies, the, the average across the four was nine and a half days in terms of us detecting that. There's, there's different logic and reasoning behind each one, and we'll go through that. Uh, but on average, it took us nine and a half days in these case studies. So even then, we're not catching it always on day one. There's, there's one of the four where we actually caught it on day one. The remaining three we did not. So when you have a really determined attacker, your, your organization does something that's uh, really special. You make a special widget, you research something that's really important. Um, right now what's happening is uh, a uh, you have a central body that's defining collection requirements and they're sourcing that from multiple different attackers and saying go get that information and you know they're going to increase their chances of getting it by having multiple attackers go out with you. Uh, what we're seeing is kind of uh, attackers evolve to use non-traditional techniques, uh, and you know they may use memory-only uh, ma malware. They may use non-persistent uh, or, or non-traditional malware. And so in this case, uh, one of the or two two of the attacks used WMI malware, which is a newer trend for us that we've seen in the last six months. <coughs> so in general, uh, we think organizations need to follow and to really actually identify and quickly, uh, rapidly respond. So. They need an investigation ready environment. So what does that mean? That means you actually have your log source decentralized. So firewall logs, proxy logs, you can concentrate logs. Uh, and from your VPN concentrator, you're actually gathering the host name of your system that's connecting to your network. Most by default don't do that. Um, proxy logs, DNS logs, DHCP logs, antivirus logs, application whitelisting logs, all those things to be centralized and searchable rapidly so that when you do find something that's in a curse, you can quickly search it. Uh, I've been in, in cases before where you show up and if you want to run a, a query over six months of data, it's going to take them like a week to get the result, you know, to, the result because of the way they've structured their, their, their scene. Uh, so you need to be able to do those type of queries. So you know, I find an IP address, tell me everybody connected to it uh, in the last six months, and I need that answer within, say, five or ten minutes. I need to cross-correlate that against your DHCP logs. You know, sort of get your DHCP logs. You're not going to be able to actually track back to a particular host. So you can identify that bad things are happening, and it was coming from these IP addresses, but you can't identify who was actually doing it. Like I mentioned before, you need to focus your uh, your setup on trying to identify compromise at multiple stages of the attack life cycle. So don't just focus on the initial either phishing attack. Now, there, there's benefit in looking for that and, and 
trying to identify and prevent it, but you're not always going to catch it there. And in, in three of these four case studies, we actually found it did through monitoring at other stations of the attack mic cycle. And then the other piece is being able to investigate and rapidly respond. So one of the challenges in, um, in incident response is if your only tool to investigate a system is taking a forensic image of it, that's not going to scale. Especially for if you're a large global organization with lots of, you know, you need to find where, this, where, where the asset is. I need to then send somebody there to either, you know, seize the asset or uh, take an image of it. I need to then encrypt it, put it on some media, and ship it back to some central location. I then need to track chain of custody and evidence. I need to, you know, receive it. I need to check it into evidence. I need to make a working copy of it. And then I can start doing analysis. And all the meanwhile, an attacker is running around your network as you're trying to catch up to them. So you need tools that are allow you to remotely pull forensic data. There are many tools out there. This is, the first purpose of this talk isn't to kind of pitch you on a particular tool, but just think about the capabilities that you need. So we use tools that allow us that we can pull forensic data from any systems. So when I find a system that's of, in, of interest, I don't care if it's in Bangalore or in Israel or in Brazil, I can pull the data that I need remotely. Both pilots can pull the event logs, I can pull the registry, I can pull the URL history, the prefetch, I can acquire files, I can find deleted files. Uh, and I can analyze the system on the fly and then you know, generate specific questions so that, OK, the attacker can use this account. Well, show me everywhere that, that account logged in. Or I know this is a compromise, but you know, this is a bad host name because they're logging into the VPN. Search it for the event logs of every single system populate, by, uh, looking for logins from that host name. So in a typical kind of network setup, so we bring two different tools to the table generally. We have host-based tools where we do kind of analysis for remote landing systems, uh, and then we do network monitoring. One of the keys of this particular slide is where we actually put the, the monitoring points. We want to monitor, of course, everything going in and out of your firewall. So we want to see what's going to your DMZ. We want to, one of the things that a lot of companies don't think about is tapping the inside interface of your VPN configure. Because if an attacker is broken into your, your VPN, it's really difficult to find. It's hard to find because it, it just looks like a, a user connecting to it. They're then moving laterally using you know, common things like RDP, <coughs> file shares. So tapping the inside interface of that VPN is very important. Uh, obviously, tapping the, the uh, you, you know, all traffic going to and from your proxies. Uh, and then the other one that, that we don't see many companies do, but that's actually tapping the, the uh, core switch infrastructure. So you can now see any traffic that's transiting your core network. So if, if it's going from one site to another site, we're going to see that traffic. And that is probably one of the most critical pieces if you're actually going to identify things in, say, the, the move laterally phase of the attack lifecycle or uh, proof escalation or some of the reconnaissance phases. You're only going to see it by monitoring traffic at that point. So if you're not doing that, a lot of these techniques won't work. So here are four case studies. We have one that involved a, uh, a joint venture. We have one that involved an outsourcer. We have one where they actually used Heartbleed to break into the event time trader. We have one where uh, we found the IE zero day uh, at this particular time. So on the joint venture, uh, the, this one this one's interesting because uh, this company has multiple you know lots of joint ventures uh, around the world, and they don't really control those joint ventures. You know, they have a forty nine percent stake in it. So they can't dictate what they do or don't do. And so the attackers broke into the joint venture. They found the emails that were being sent from the joint venture to, to the, uh, the client's network. Uh, and they found a, you know, one that had a, it was recently sent with an Excel attachment. So they stripped off the Excel attachment, created an Excel macro, Excel SM, and then resend that out to the group saying, hey, I have an updated you know, copy of the document. Please take a look. So of course, everyone clicked on it because it's coming from email addresses through email infrastructure in a conversation that they were expecting to receive from the guy. So at that point, the, uh, what was new is when we were doing analysis of the system, um, I was looking for, for the persistent menu. So it dropped a JavaScript backdoor, uh, which was new for us. I, we, we'd never seen that before. Um, the actual persistence mechanism took me, I actually passed over it the first time uh, when going through the system and trying to look for it. Probably took me an hour and a half to find it. Uh, what they did was they created a link file. And that link file was in a startup folder. And 
I didn't know you could do this until I found this, but they actually invoked in the link file the Windows scripting host, so WScript, and invoked, used Windows scripting host to invoke the JavaScript file. So link file in a starter folder, Windows scripting host, executing JavaScript. Pretty cool. Really hard to find, and you know, kind of a novel or, or creative approach. So the back door beaconed out to a uh, cloud website that was, you know, that would be able to, or, you know, categorized and not blocked and allowed by in, in any organization. And it went and it downloaded the uh, uh, command uh, in terms of what it should do or where it should connect to or, or what command it should run. Some of the other interesting aspects from this one, um, so they, they used JavaScript backdoors. They also used WMI. But once they started moving laterally, they would use the JavaScript backdoors to install uh, malware and the person spent his with, with WMI. So from a detection perspective, it took us 28 days to detect the activity. It's a long time. How do we detect it? We, by, by monitoring site to site traffic, when the attacker finally escalated their privileges and got out of a particular a network zone, and they moved to a different, you know, they, they, they accessed the server, they dumped password hashes on the server, and they copied the files over. So we saw fly across the network password pass hashes in their bias. And so that was actually the detect detection mechanism for us. So in the attack lifecycle, uh, this is kind of the diagram we generally use. Um, it starts with initial recon. Uh, then you have initial compromise, established foothold. Uh, an attacker then needs to escalate their privileges. From escalating their privileges, they're going to then start conducting recon internally. They're going to move laterally to other systems, try and maintain presence by you know, dropping additional backdoors, um, and then further escalating their privileges. So that you usually go in that cycle for a little bit, uh, and then eventually they want to complete their mission. So this is when I talk about the attack life cycle, this is what we're talking about. And thinking about, if you actually think about an attack in that perspective, in organizing your, your defenses and your detection mechanisms around that, you can actually come up with some pretty creative ways. So in this one, it's actually technically in two, both move laterally and escalate privileges. Because the attacker at this point was already on a system, and they were trying to move in you know, a number of systems, and they were trying to move laterally. They had some privilege accounts to a couple of systems, and they were trying to escalate their privileges to get, to get a domain administrator account. So why did it take us 28 days? Well, the first piece was they did nothing for the first 13 days after compromising the first system, other than you know making sure they had a backdoor and a presence there. They didn't really use that system much, so that was 13 days worth of it. Their activity for the first 28 days was all within a very small isolated network zone, uh, you know, an office with you know, 30 hosts or so. And they didn't really actually escalate their privileges or break out or of that network zone uh, until day 28. And when they did, that's when we identified it. So the 28 days can be a little misleading because although they were there for that period, they, didn't, they weren't able to actually do anything with, with it. You know, uh, they, they, they hadn't gotten to the point yet where they were stealing data or identifying it. They were still uh, in the early phase of the attack life cycle. So, from when we identified it, when we actually scoped and remediated, it took us three days. It actually took us two. Um, we investigated it, we removed the attackers, we blocked their, their command control, we removed the infected systems. This particular client had another joint venture, and it, with this joint venture, they had, um, they had to allow certain ports for that joint venture to access their SAP investment. And so on their firewall rules, they allowed uh, 3380 to 3390 on their, because some SAP uses some of the ports. Well, what's the RDP protocol? 3389. So although we removed the attacker's malware, we blocked their CQ, and we changed the passwords of the, the, the accounts we knew they had, there were other passwords that they had gained. So they just RDP'd from this other network. So you, you squash them on one side, and they popped over from, from this other network. Um, that we didn't know existed, that we didn't know they had a connection to. Um, and uh, so that was, that was what we spent the third day finding out about and dealing with. So in this case, uh, when all was said and done, we had seven infected systems. We had 57 access systems where they were attempting to check their credentials, see if it was privileged, dump passwords, trying to you know, escalate their privileges, et cetera. 
And we basically use 13 different network-based indicators of customers, so IPs and domains. So one of the other interesting things about this case, uh, and this is the first time we've seen it, uh, was uh, they used WMI for persistence. So kind of a, a primer on what WMI is. Uh, it's on every system since Windows 2000. So it's in, you know, it's pretty much ubiquitous now and running by default on every system. Uh, the whole point is to allow remote re-engine of systems through VB script or PowerShell. Uh, and I think Dave Cole is giving a talk later today about how you know, potentially being able to use this to do conduct do remote, remote forensic analysis. What's interesting is um, there are they're called managed object files, and they're used to implement particular classes in WMI. <coughs> so you can't just uh, put a piece of software on an end system. You actually have to compile it on that system in order for it to run and be incorporated into the uh, instrumentation. So that will show up as kind of a key source of forensic evidence uh, later in the case. The main namespace that you'll use uh, in terms of implementing those, cl those classes is called root slash 7D2. And then lastly, the information, the actual backdoor itself, will be stored in a data structure called objects.data. And this is important because if you're, if you're say, you're timelining a system, you know it was compromised on a particular date and time, and you're looking for a piece of malware or a binary, there will be no binary. And if you're just, just doing plain timeline analysis, you may miss it because the objects.data file will, will have been created when the system was installed, and it will, it's going to modify constantly, so it's not going to show up in your, in your time window. So how can you actually instrument or, or implement WMI malware? You can either write, write a JavaScript backdoor, you can write a VBScript backdoor, or you can write a PowerShell backdoor. Uh, the two that we've seen so far are JavaScript and VBScript. One of the interesting things to note about this particular case uh, was that the way that they invoked, um, they actually invoked an instantiation of the Internet Explorer. And so uh, again, in case you read on our blog, Devin Kerr blogged about it uh, on our website, where he actually talked about the Windows scripting hosts and uh, how they implemented uh, this particular backdoor. What, what that allowed for us is, because it invoked an Internet Explorer instance, it actually stored the commands that they were pulling down in temporary Internet files. So we just went to temporary Internet files. We could basically pull and parse every one of those, and we had every command they typed. Uh, so I don't think they knew that that's what was happening in the background. So even though we didn't detect it for 28 days, we actually could very quickly figure out what they were doing during that time period. So here's an example of what you might expect to see from WMI malware. You're going to define an event filter. So, you know, what's happening, it's basically monitoring what's happening you know, on, on various parts of the system. You're creating an event filter. You're setting the namespace, which is roots and v2. You have to give it a name. And then you have a query. The query is actually how they do the persistence mechanism in this case. So it's checking the internal system clock time. And anytime it hits five seconds, it's going to fire. So that's implemented using the Windows query language. So that's actually what, what is kicking off the, the, the JavaScript backdoor. Now what you'll see is an instance of the active script, script event consumer. And so it's actually consuming that. You have the scripting engine you have to define. So in this case, it's JavaScript. You can also do VB script or PowerShell. Uh, you see a new active X object. Uh, and so this is where they're actually implementing the logic of, of, of what it's doing. It's longer than this, but this is kind of a, you know, a short thing so you can actually see what it looks like. So from a forensic perspective, what's this going to look like? Well, if you're you know, assuming it's a, it, an, an end user workstation, you might have some prefetch files. So some of the prefetch files you might be looking for, you might see. You're going to see C script or W script, depending on how they've been built, uh, you know, what they're if they're using a DB script backdoor or if they're using a JavaScript backdoor. You might see MopComp. So MopComp is the, uh, the actual compiler, the MLF compiler, that they're going to have to use in order to get it installed on that system. And SCRCon is the, uh, the Windows script host. Or Windows script event consumer host. <coughs> um, if you're lucky, you may see the actual MOF file. Um, in, in some cases we did, in other cases we didn't. Uh, you can't assume or rely that that's going to be there. Uh, you may also see a, a, a file show up in the auto recovery directory. And then lastly, if you look at the registry, uh, registry timestamping, 
uh, an analysis, you may see some red shift modified reference, referencing group SIMV2, or in this case, the Win32 clock provider if, um, if they use that as a person's perspective. Is that uh, to be found in the um, object's data? Yeah, the, the, the actual, um, the back door itself will be in the object's uh, data data structures. It's usually pretty big, especially on a server. It's going to be anywhere from 30 to 80 megs. So you're going to have to take that file. Um, you're going to have to parse it looking for this. So in, in that ASAP, is just basically commands or uh, the technique? Like how, like, how would you look for that? Yeah. So some of the techniques that we found that are useful uh, that, that don't happen very often <laughs> in objects.data would be um, certain things like wscript.echo, okay. um, wscript. Um, there, there are three or four ones that are pretty new. A new ActiveX object is pretty unique. Um, uh, instantiating i explore. The um, looking for the, the anything that has an, an event consumer, uh, which I put on the, the blue side just before. All right. um, there's also another technique I'll talk about here in a minute, which you can use. So if you see the, the, the hashtag prag auto recover at the top of the NLF file, what that means is, uh, and I have a link here of, of Microsoft reference to it, um, in case the cache gets corrupted, there's a series of files in the auto recover directory that I reference. And so if it gets corrupted, it can rebuild and recompile the, uh, the WMI cache uh, from that. So if they instantiate Pragma Auto Recover, you'll have an MLF file show up in their Auto Recover directory. If they don't specify that in the script, you won't see one. So you can't just go to the Auto Recover directory to look at all the WMI uh, scripts that are on the system. So if you were to actually do this yourself, this is not from the attack, this is just something that we made up. Um, the way that you would install it, you're going to see mock, uh, you know, mock up. You have to actually compile the MLF file. So you're going to see it actually get compiled. Uh, it's going to parse it and then place it in the repository, the object set that repository. Uh, Microsoft recently just updated system, uh, the, the auto run tool. That, uh, so it will actually now detect it. So if you, this is actually a, a system where we ran it on the, uh, you know, we, have, we had an infected objects.data, and that's the way it shows up right there. You have a WMI database entry with the, uh, with the name sm.consumer. And then if you click on the double click of a copy, you'll actually get the data of like what it's actually running. This is, this is the actual object it was running. It was encoded, so we actually had to decode that. This is the little snippet. Before I move on, the, the challenge here is that WMI malware, uh, there's almost no information on it like, publicly on the internet. There's like one trend micro article uh, talking about this. So all this we had to kind of figure out on our own and, and uh, made, made the first you know, analysis of this and figuring out how it would work, what do you do, how do you find it, how do we enable other people to find it if, if, if it happens, uh, has been, been pretty difficult. So uh, this is kind of our, our, at least our first attempt to document some of, some of the things for the forensics community. And, uh, Hopefully, you'll see more coming up. All right, so that was case one. Uh, case two was interesting, um, largely because there was pretty much no backdoor malware used. Uh, the attackers broke in. What they did was they, um, this particular company outsourced their SAP uh, management of their SAP systems to, to a different a, a company. And so that company had uh, direct access to RDP using a local administrator account on one system. So the attacker compromised, so this is a different attacker, they compromised this this uh, this other company, the outsourcer, leveraged that tunnel between the two companies, RDP'd into the system, and then used that system as a beachhead to start moving ladder. So from when they actually broke into when we detected, it took us two days. And the way that we detected it is because they deployed a web shell. So they were in a particular part of the network, um, in a smaller part of their network, and they had uh, escalated their privilege and privileges and were trying to move laterally. So the, um, the attackers had uh, gotten on the domain controller for the smaller network, dumped password hashes, uh, and none of those accounts worked on the, the domain network. 
So they started doing port scans and looking for internal vulnerabilities and, and misconfigurations. We found a Tomcat server that had a default administrator credential. So they accessed the Tomcat server, deployed the web shell, and then um, used that web shell to then run commands on the operating system. So we saw that over the network. We saw the deployment of that web shell. So from an attack lifecycle perspective, this was in the move lateral, move lateral phase. So there's, there's kind of a trend here that you'll, you'll start seeing. So what made this case interesting was that because of that access they had, they, did, they didn't need any backdoors. So they leveraged the access to this host. They targeted the, the client's RSA infrastructure. They found users uh, who were in pin-only mode because they required two-factor authentication to access their VPN. Found users that were in pin-only mode and got their pins and then used that to VPN into the network. So between the access from the outsourcer and the access from the VPN, they didn't need backdoors. The way that we were able to put all this together is because of Netflow data. If we didn't have the Netflow data that was tracking it back, um, as we finally traced it back to this particular system, uh, you know, we're doing analysis, we're finding an account that logged in, uh, we're searching for use of that account. Uh, it took us all the way back to this one system uh, that was managed by the, 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 the outsourcer. And um, you know, we saw logins from a particular IP address, we asked the client what the IP address was. They're like, oh, that's our outsourcer. So, we then had to do an notification with the outsourcer and let them know that they have uh, an issue as well. So from detection to scoping and remediation, it took us two days to, to kind of put together the story, figure out what happened, and actually get, you know, get it successfully remediated. Um, so no infected systems from a backdoor perspective. Uh, they accessed 27 systems in the environment, and they, they used no real network infrastructure because they didn't have any backdoor. So, um, the, uh, this particular client uh, also had Heartbleed used against them. Uh, the attack group used Heartbleed against them was the same as the attack group in the first case study. Um, when we actually, uh, this is actually the second client where we had uh, evidence and, and use of Heartbleed. So, this isn't what we blogged about back on, you know, early or, or mid-April. Um, this is the, the, the second use of it. Uh, and some of what's different is in the initial attacks on Heartbleed, um, it, it actually triggered a lot of uh, IDS alerts. And so uh, if you, you know, the way that they were doing the exploit uh, was, was while the connection was unencrypted. Um, the way that they used Heartbleed, so this was later, this was about a week later is when they did, when they did this. Uh, after the initial exploit was they had uh, upped their game in terms of they actually moved the use of the Heartbleed exploit to after the SSL uh, encrypted channel. So we had a full take half of the data, and it didn't flag on a single idea so it was all encrypted. Uh, and so all of the actual exploitation was in the, the encrypted uh, tunnel, which made it much harder to identify. So they used the Heartbleed exploit in this particular case to actually break into the VPN concentrator. And so uh, this is actually the second instance um, of the, the VPN, uh, of the VPN kind of triggered by that manufacturer being targeted uh, in our experience. You know, it makes sense that, that you're going to see, uh, you know, if you want to break into a company, that's actually probably the best way to, to, to you know, leverage that exploit to, to have some effect. Because otherwise you're just going to be, you know, if you just target a website, you may be able to get some credentials to that website or some information from that website. If you actually want to break into the company and do things internally, this is probably the best way to do it. So from, you know, from when they broke in to when we actually detected it, it took eight days. What we saw was the attackers, uh, as they moved laterally through the network, uh, there's only so many ways that you can actually get something to run on a remote system. Uh, and one of those that's common for many attackers is using Windows scheduled task. And so we saw them you know, schedule a task across the network on an unnamed scheduled task uh, and execute you know, a particular file. And then, uh, and so that's what we flagged on. Now, what's interesting here in this particular case, um, you know, we don't go into cases like with, with a preconceived notion of, of what happened. We, 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 let, we let the leads 
um, kind of develop and generate, and then we follow those leads. So in this particular case, you see a window scheduled task. You know, we didn't immediately jump to, oh, it must have been heartbeat. You know, we have to work our way back to get that. And so there's various you know, methods and techniques that we use to do that. Some of that's going to be you know, pulling forensic data from the system. So I now have two systems that are of interest. I have the system that had the Windows task schedule run on it, and then the system where they did that from. So I'm going to pull forensic data from those two systems. I'm going to start analyzing that and try to you know, develop additional leads, figure out what happened. Um, the, this was the same attack group. So they were using WMI malware again with JavaScript backdoors. Um, they use a different uh, CQ or, or cloud provider for those backdoors. Um, in this particular version, I tend to use some Google, uh, some Google websites. Uh, that it would track to the Google sites uh, where they could where they could manipulate um, some some particular strings. It would download that, and that would be the command for for the uh, for the for the backdoor. So we're we're tracing this back, and uh, we get to a Citrix server, and so we start asking more questions about well, you know, what is the Citrix server? What does it do? How can you access it? And it turns out that this Citrix server is only accessible from the VPN. It's not directly accessible from the internet because that was our first thought. Is okay, you we know, must have broken into the Citrix server in some way. Um, the Citrix server wasn't wasn't directly accessible from the internet, and when you leak into the network, you can't just get direct network access. You actually have to connect to the Citrix server first and move from there. So we started pulling on the thread a bit more, um, asking more questions. Okay, well, um, we started doing you know, forensic analysis, and, and we see logins that are initiating you know to that system from the VPN. So we have the client pull their logs. Uh, from their, their VPN concentrator. And um, we looked for the signs that you would expect to see for, for Heartbleed. So in a um, in VPN concentrator, they're actually tracking, I have a, a, some, some sample logs here in a minute, but actually tracks the IP address you're coming from. And then if you change your IP address, it'll, it'll track that as well. And so with Heartbleed, what you're looking for in, in terms of use of it, you're looking for if you have two active session tokens. So if I steal a session token, and you have two active ones, you're going to see it flipping back and forth between one user and another user, and one user and another user in kind of rapid fashion. And so that was the, the kind of telltale sign here, the hardware was using. So again, we caught this one in the move liability phase of the attack life cycle. This one also used JavaScript backdoors and WMI. So from a uh, detection per perspective, uh, once we detected it, it took us two days to actually scope and read the compromise, find out what happened, what did they do, what, how did they get in, and, and trace it back from, you know, just from this window schedule task, tracing all the way back to the use hardware to, to, to break in. So this, this client had yet patched the VPN concentrator because, you know, most of the time in the press, it, it, in, in this April time period, was focused on, you know, internet facing systems that were like websites, not uh, VPN and VPN concentrators. So they were able to deploy backdoor malware to five systems. They accessed additional two, and we found nine network indicators. So this is kind of some redacted VPN concentrator logs, and probably it's small, so I apologize for those in the back who can't see it. But what, what you'll see is, um, if you just look at the VPN concentrator logs, you'll see in, in fairly short time period, you'll see it changing from an IP address of one user you know, uh, to a different IP address. Um, and that's pretty normal when you're connected to the VPN if you go from you know, wired connection to wireless or you're moving, you know, say on your campus uh, to different buildings and something, uh, and, and you have a, a, an active connection. It's fine that your IP changes, that's normal. But what's not normal is the, the same session token being used to then come from one IP and then come from another and then come back from that, that same IP and, and kind of that rapid, you know, the, the, that rapid flip flopping is not normal. And that's, that, that's a kind of classic sign of the heartbeat. So if you look at NetFlow logs, so we have NetFlow from this particular, um, you're going to see, so this attack started at 2.11.45. And so you see, you know, many, many, many requests over 443 uh, hitting on, on NetFlow. So the attack started at 2.11. 2.15.08, we actually have another one, and that lines up with the, uh, the first evidence of the, 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 uh, the VPN concentrator flip-flopping at 2.15.11. So we have a three-second, you know, um, uh, or an overlap there pretty well, lining up the, the, the evidence of the attack and what they did with the, the VPN logs. And 
the other thing you can do, um, and, and the, the, we, we can't prove this, but we think it's likely that it occurred, is we can prove how they got into the, the Citrix server itself. Um, and, and our theory is that they use a Heartbleed exploit. So any user that's logging into the VPN and retyping in their using the password, uh, or if you have a, a password and pin combination, um, it, that's going to be stored in memory on that web server. So if you're using Heartbleed on the end system, you're basically pulling random, random chunks of memory from that end system. And uh, you may actually get the, the username and password in your text from, from that, in addition to the session token. Additionally, all of the, the activity that you do over that session uh, is also going to be in memory on that VPN constrictor. So um, we think that they either got credentials from memory of the VPN constrictor um, through Heartbleed, or um, from a, a user connecting to Citrix that they pulled that from memory of, of the VPN constraints. One, one of those two, because they just then logged into the Citrix server uh, with credentials, and there's no evidence as to how they got that. And you know, this is you know, the, the, the 215 time frame is really the first time we saw any use of this particular IP address. There's no evidence of other attacks, other malware, or anything else that could explain kind of what they did, how they got there, et cetera. So, uh, Recently, um, and, uh, and and this one, this this one always uh, actually makes me laugh. Um, so I'm, uh, we saw initially we saw uh, we detected this one. We actually saw a uh, uh, the attackers were setting up phishing emails. So uh, we see a phishing email get sent, and the way that we detected it um, was we actually had a network signature for their backdoor. So we flagged on the network signature. So you know our managed, our, our managed fence team says, "Hey, we found something. Go investigate it." So the you know anytime we have a network signature um, or a network alert for backdoor, uh, I generally want to answer three questions. So what is it? So what's the malware that caused that that beacon? When did it get there? And how did it get there? And answering those three questions is really critical from an incident response perspective because that should drive your response strategy. If I tell you that a system got infected today through a phishing attack, and we, we, we can tell you the network indicator, and then nothing else happened, your response is going to be different, right? You're going to take that system and you're going to you know, pay it and move on. If I tell you that this system got infected a month ago, laterally with a domain administrator account from this other system, how you respond to that and, and, and uh, the next actions you take is going to be very different. So in this particular case, we're trying to answer those three questions. We see a network alert, what happened, how did it get here? So. When, when the network alert first went off, it was on a Thursday. And the first thing the client did was they actually pulled the plug from the system, so we couldn't analyze it. So we knew there was a network alert. They, they, they put blocks in place, but we couldn't analyze it. So on Friday, um, and of course, it's always, it's always on a Friday. Uh, on, on Friday of that week, um, you know, I have dinner plans with my girlfriend. And uh, we get another alert. We get another a network alert. And we finally had agents on two of these systems that, that uh, had the network alert. And we pulled forensic data from them. So it's like, you know, 7 or 7.30 at night when you know, I'm sitting in my bedroom in, in my office and I'm working away trying to pull, pull forensic data from them. So, and uh, my girlfriend's like, hey, we got an appointment at 8. Uh, are we going to make that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I just have something important that I need to do real quick. So um, some people from our Intel team have been kind of analyzing the alerts from, from the day before and, and a number of other things and, and thought there may, maybe maybe something uh, involved. They, they, they tried to go to the website from the day before and, and download the exploit. Uh, they were unable to. Uh, it was no longer being served. And, but they had some suspicions there may be something going on. So um, they asked us if we could actually take a look at the system and, and find anything forensically that would, would find evidence of zero day. So looking at the system, um, my girlfriend's patiently waiting, uh, and you know, one of the first things I'm looking for is, is there a persistence mechanism? Because usually if you, want to, if you drop malware on the system, you want it to persist and survive a reboot. <coughs> on this system, there was no persistence mechanism. There was no binary. So I knew exactly when the alert started, I'm looking at the system, there's no binary on disk. So in this particular case, they used memory-only uh, malware. Um, they fished three or 400 users at a time. Uh, and then assumed that they would have enough users that got compromised that they could use the memory-only backdoor uh, then to drop additional second-stage malware. So 
um, 8 o'clock rolls around, 8.15 rolls around, uh, and I finally see find your old history showing the website they went to. Uh, I see a JavaScript file and a Shockwave file. So I acquire those files um, and I'll show you in a, in a minute. Um, but I mean, pass it off for an hour to me and, uh, and, and then, you know, they validated what it was, uh, that, that was the actual exploit code um, between those two, uh, those two files. So 8.30 or so, I was able to, to, to head off. We were a little late for dinner, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm getting, like, text messages and, and phone calls and, and other things because, you know, within an hour, they'd actually, you know, validated it was a zero day. Uh, they had generated proof of concept code that they wanted to send to Microsoft so they didn't have to have to send the, the, the real exploit code. Um, and so my girlfriend's frustrated because, you know, I'm at dinner and, like, I'm on my phone and, like, this is kind of a big deal and she doesn't, you know, doesn't really understand. And uh, so I'm trying to explain to her, like, what a zero day is and obviously it, it, it uh, so, so the best part is the next week, uh, when, when, the, when the advisory finally comes out um, uh, for Microsoft, uh, you know, because the, the, there's about a week period where, where they didn't have a patch. And so her IT department on, two, on Tuesday emailed everybody and said, please stop using Internet Explorer. And so she then told all of her coworkers, like, my boyfriend's responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so this one we actually, we, we caught it in the, uh, the established foothold phase of the life cycle, right? We caught it early, we, we, we didn't actually detect a phishing email, but we detected the, the evidence of, of the, uh, the backdoor from a network perspective. So, what were some of the forensic artifacts? So, you have URL history showing the user going to a particular website. We have this ftv.temp file. Uh, that particular temp file uh, was an Adobe uh, helper file. And so the vulnerability used a return after free, uh, and so it needed Adobe a, a return after free um, technique, and so it needed uh, Adobe to, to actually get loaded. And so they could guarantee they, they, they couldn't guarantee the class was installed or what version was installed. So they dropped this helper file and used that to get their exploit code loaded. You see the JavaScript file and a Shockwave file in the user temporary history. That was it in terms of forensic artifacts, like. That was, that, that was all that was there. And then if you do memory analysis, there were two IS4 processes that were started at that exact same time as this activity. So this is kind of a snippet of some of the exploit code. Um, it's just looking for you know, what, what version of, of IE are you running. And there's obviously a lot more of that. But that's what was in the inside of that JS. So you know, when I grabbed that, I didn't, I didn't know what it was at the time. But when I looked at it, you, know, you could tell it was an exploit just from, just from looking at it. So the email, uh, this is an example of one of the emails that was sent. So um, over the course of a week period from, from, when, the, uh, from when this happened to when the patch was released, uh, we had 14 clients that were, were, were fished. We had four rounds of phishing emails coming from different unique sites, all with different unique links. This is an example of one of them. Um, they weren't particularly targeted or, or you know, um, savvy, but users were clicking on links. And uh, when you send it, you know, uh, when you send it to a large num number of people, you're going to get enough people to click, click on it. The, uh, the interesting point about the, in, in this particular case with the 14 clients being, being compromised, it, it made it really good unique for us. But the, you know, once we found the initial piece, uh, we, we, we could then develop some really good network signatures for the actual use of the zero day. So once we found it the first time, we then created great signatures for it. So then every time after that, we then identified it quickly, found the C2, worked with our clients, and so of our 14 clients, the attackers didn't get you know, established in, in, in any of them, even though initial, you know, initial users got compromised. Um, so hundreds of infected systems over the course of the week, um, but you know, the attacker, you know, in one case, they downloaded a second stage backdoor, uh, and we got the system pulled off the network within you know, a couple of hours. And so they, the other piece is they were targeting so many different companies, uh, hundreds of hundreds of companies have been targeted with by this particular group. Um, of the groups that we tracked, this is probably one of the most sophisticated, uh, and they're probably one of the best. Uh, I've personally investigated them. It's a group we call AT3. I've probably investigated them about six or eight times, uh, and they're really, really, really good. So of the of our of our four cases, 
Uh, we have three different unique attackers. This was the third unique attacker. So we kind of go back to our premise of detection is really hard. You know, they can come at you in all different ways. They can use techniques that you've either never seen or heard of before, or connections to your network that you don't know about, or that may not be monitored. Um, you can't always assume that it's going to be, um, you know, through the same avenue or same mechanism every time. So 229 days, at least in our caseload. So how can we actually, as an industry, how can we get this number lower? So I have a couple of ideas here, um, you know, some of them of which we've already implemented, some you could implement in your environment. Um, but you know, if you look at like, the lateral movement phase, how do you detect that? Well, you can look for remote command or file execution across your network. So you know, there's a couple different ways you could do that. Um, you could look for evidence of password dumping or transferring the, the password caches through NetBIOS. You could look for misuse of privilege accounts uh, in your network. So different organizations track things differently. So say you, you take your um, you take all your domain control logs and you centralize them. <coughs> And enable NTLM debug logging, so you can actually get the source and destination of that you know, account or of that login. You, know, you can now come up with potentially for all of your privileged accounts a, a profile of where they logged into and what, what they've done. You can either look for anomalies in that, or send your your admins, you know, hey, here's 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 evidence of where you logged into and from today. Please validate this. Um, I know other organizations they do things like they'll set up a, a jump server farm, and so if, in order to get into, into jump servers, you need two-factor authentication. And then by policy, not you know, actually prevent you from doing this, but you, you have to RDP from the system that, that jump server from. So if you just monitor all your servers looking for a login that's not originating from the jump server from, that would be an, an immediate generic indicator that something bad has happened. Internal recon, you, you look for things like port scanning, running tools like SQL map, uh, but you, you have to look for that, you know, that system internally that, that, that's acting maliciously. Um, from completing the mission, you can look for a creation of, uh, you know, every attacker loves VAR. Um, you know, use of, of WinRAR, um, looking for, uh, you know, the, the header of an encrypted RAR file being transferred through, through NetBIOS across your network or, or out of your network. You can look for NetFlow logs looking for large outbound file transfers. And then I guess kind of what, what I want to leave it with is, um, you know, you know as, you're, as you're leaving here, what can you do in your environment that, you know, to generically find this? Uh, so I want you to think about that and think about you know, some of these tactics, some of these techniques, and then you know, you're going to know your environment way better than the attacker would or should. What can you do that would actually make it so you're more successful at detecting this generic? Right. Uh, that's all I have for today. Yeah. We have uh, 10 minutes for questions. Here, uh, first example, why were you finding the command temporary internet files? Um, they were instantiating a, a I Explore, an I Explore instance, uh, um, a new ActiveX object that, that instantiated I Explore. Um, if you look at uh, Devin Kerr's blog, he actually has more details about it. Um, or on Nadine's blog, Devin Kerr's blog post. Um, but because it was instantiating I, an actual web browser, it, it, the, the, the operating system was doing things that we normally do, which is cache websites you've been to. And so it was caching, um, you know, the, the, each time it pulled down a, uh, a command, it was caching that in terms of files. Thanks. Um, so from a user awareness standpoint, I'm, I'm going back to this fishing expedition that took 28 days to, <coughs> you know, to come to light. You're saying that in, in that organization's environment, users received a spreadsheet that did not give them the expected result that was stated in the email, and nobody said squat. So what's interesting is they, they, they stripped off the Excel attachment uh, with all the content in the Excel attachment, created an XLSM, so added, embedded a macro in it. So when they sent it, they, when, they, when the users opened it, it had real content. So they actually were expecting but what was in it. But it wasn't different from what they had before. It wasn't different, but it wasn't um, it wasn't unexpected. You know, we, we interviewed them and they talked to users and, and it was um, it, that that's that's the type of thing that's gonna fly in the radar. I mean there, you know if you look at the the I the um, what's a lot more prevalent are the cases like the uh, I zero day where they're gonna send out kind of a more form or generic message. Uh, but we see everything from like really generic to that's one of the examples of some of the most targeted um, 
uh, fishing attacks recently. Even in regards to uh, response tools, so when you run the tools, so do you copy the tool on the machine like locally, or there's a way that you can avoid copying the tool because that is why that the Sure. So uh, in environment, so from, from a tools perspective, uh, Mandiant, we uh, write software, and so it, we use a, a, a tool called Mandiant for intelligent response. And so it, you have to deploy an agent to every single system. And so because the agent's already there, I can then run run things and pull forensic data from that host without having to worry, you know, with, with the exception of pushing out the first time, without having to worry about copying over additional tools. And then the output from it gets streamed back to a central location so that, so that the, the output results aren't on that same system. Did you ever make up uh, those dinner plans with your boss later? Pick her out after ruining her date. <laughs> um. <laughs> when, when when she saw the uh, like kind of the importance of it in terms of like what it meant and then the publicity about it and uh, you know interview requests and uh, you know large scale you know campaigns and, and, and information about it, I think it. it, it uh, help me a little bit there in terms of uh, ruining our dinner plans. But you know, when when you do incident response, um, you know, this is a, this is a life cycle. This is what happens, right? Like, you know, you get called, you know, randomly on a Friday night, and, and of course it's always on a Friday night, and you get your weekend ruined, or or you, know, you have to work really long hours. Um, that's just kind of what what, what goes with the territory. Uh, some of my favorite investigations are actually search investigations for our managed defense clients. Um, you know, a lot of our investigations are really, really old. Like you know, they broke in two years ago. And the amount of forensic data that's there for you to recover and, and, and reconstruct is really hard. When you get there and the attack was two days ago, like that's a piece of cake. Like there's so many, like there's so much data you can work with and pull it back. You know, I'm, I'm used to dealing with cases where like you're like pulling it like threads to like pull like put together a story like what may have actually happened. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Now we have a half an hour networking break. Uh, there's breakfast uh, out there already with coffee. Awesome. Bagels. Oh, bagels. Very cool. Uh, the next presentation, 1030. And uh, they'll be in track one and two there in the ballroom. Oh, it starts at 10? So it's 9.30 now. It starts at 10. Woo!